Let's get started. So today we have Tom Bruce. Tom Bruce is a PhD candidate at James Cook University. Uh, his advisors include um, uh, Steve Williams. Um, who, who are your other advisors, Tom? Uh, ben Hills is a lecturer up here at JCU and works on Kuwaiti training in Panama. And then Ronald Jamamin is a senior wildlife biologist for the Zoological Society of London. Mm -hmm. And we know um, we know some of those people, I'm sure. So Tom works on the ecology and management of feral cats in um, Australian wet tropics. He has a focus on which factors are driving feral cat distribution, how they interact with other species, and which methods could allow protected area managers to control cat populations in the future. And before he came to Australia, Tom spent years uh, in the rainforest in the Congo Basin of Africa, uh, mostly in, the, in a corner of the Cameroon called for a beautiful forest called the Jaw Forest, which is a UNESCO World, Her World Heritage Site. And that's where I actually first heard about Tom's work because that's where one of the sites that I'm in. And Tom's one of the only people who to ever sample these very remote, very difficult to um, work uh, rainforest. And he, he did so on a number of really cool, charismatic, large animals, and then came to Australia and studied very small and problematic cats. So I don't know if that's a downgrade or what, but um, he's definitely cut his teeth and, uh, and gets our respect and has done a lot of really important, great conservation work in places that need it. So um, I'm really happy to have him. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Tom. Awesome. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you for coming, everyone, and taking the time out of your day. Um, as Matthew said, my talk is on feral cats in the rainforest, on their occupancy, species interactions, and management. It basically covers my PhD work over the last three years. So yeah, let's get into it. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where we are all gathered today, and particularly where my field work was carried out. And I really thank them for allowing me to access their ancestral areas to look into feral cats and carry out some research. And importantly, I pay my respects to all elders past, present, and emerging. Now, Australia has the unenviable title of having the highest loss of species globally. Tom, uh, your audio is is audible, like we can hear you, but it's not yeah. as clear as it probably should be. I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you have like headphones and the speaker on at the same time or something. Oh, so yeah. So if I turn, so oh, if so I mute much you. Oh, right. Way better. We're good. OK, if I sit over here, it's better. Oh, so much better, man. All right. I'll shift Steve's office around a bit. All right. Cool. I'll start at the beginning here again then. Well, just at the beginning of the slide. Yeah, just the slide is good. Thank you. Great. Cool. So Australia has the unenviable title of having the highest loss of species globally. In the last 200 years, 27 endemic mammals have gone extinct. And in comparison, in the same time period, only one has gone extinct within the USA. And this is super unusual, and you probably wouldn't expect it, because predictors of mammalian decline are usually tied to high human population density, a lack of habitat protection and significant habitat alteration, and also poverty. And Australia doesn't really score highly on any of these factors, so you wouldn't expect mammal declines to be a really big problem. However, within Australia, we believe there to be four main causes of mammalian declines. These are habitat loss, climate change, altered fire regimes, and invasive predators. And unfortunately, these factors all interact synergistically with one another. So I'm going to use these images to describe an example. As you can see here, there's a fragmented patch of rainforest up on the Atherton Tablelands um, in the North Queensland, Australia. And within this forest patch, it's now more vulnerable to climate change. So as the weather around the forest patch warms up, light can penetrate further into the core of the forest than it previously would have done. And this increased aridity then causes plants to die, increases fuel load, and then unfortunately, it changes the likelihood of the fire regime altering itself. Now, an altered fire regime can lead to longer and more intense burns, which in turn can then reduce refugia and cover for native fauna to avoid becoming predated upon by invasive predators. These native fauna now are more likely to be eaten by the invasive predator, and therefore their populations decline directly. And finally, the invasive predator is now better able to penetrate the landscape by traveling along the more open habitat and then moving into the forest itself, increasing the risk of declines of mammals in this forest patch. Now, when I say feral cats in Australia to you, you likely already have an image in your mind of the deserts of Australia heaving with feral cats, causing declines of betongs and extinctions of subspecies of the bilby. 
And you're not far wrong. There's estimated to be 2.1 to 6.3 million individual feral cats residing in Australia today. And they're thought to kill 2 billion vertebrates annually. Now, this all leads to the question, where are feral cats in Australia? And there's been some really seminal work done on this. And there are generally two main theories that are driving the distribution of feral cats. Uh, the first one by Leg et al poses that rainfall is the big driver of feral cats in, the, in Australia in general, uh, with the high density areas being in the arid parts of Australia and then the wetter parts generally being unsuitable for feral cat populations. The other theory is that dingoes themselves can prevent feral cats from uh, taking hold in Australia and exclude them or reduce their likelihood of occupying a habitat. And as you can see from this map here, there's variation in dingo populations anyway. But what both of these theories have in common is that they would lead you to believe that feral cats should be absent in wet and complex environments such as tropical rainforest. Now, taking a step back from this, if we look globally, it, pretty much every tropical rainforest in the world has an extant species of medium or small wild cat species, denoted on this graph by the little black cats on the green rainforest habitat patches. And also, feral cats themselves have been able to establish themselves in island rainforests such as Fiji, Madagascar and Hawaii. So this led me to ask, why should Australia be any different if every other rainforest is suitable for cats and feral cats can establish themselves in island rainforests? Why would they not be able to establish themselves in the rainforest of Australia? And this brings me nicely to my study here, the wet tropics in far north Queensland, as you can see located here. Um, despite only making 0.12% of the area of Australia, it is the most species rich region within Australia. This forest has been standing since the Gondwanan era which has meant that it's now been inscribed as a World Heritage Site due to its outstanding natural biodiversity, including 70 species that are endemic to the region. Now, unfortunately, given those previous studies I mentioned, predicting that feral cats shouldn't occur in this habitat type, there's really been a significant lack of work on feral cats in the wet tropics, and almost nothing is known about their ecology in this environment. Uh, and this is where my PhD project comes in, and it generally had three broad objectives to try and answer those general questions about cat ecology and then suggest some management to help parks and wildlife actually begin to get on top of the problem if cats are shown to be a problem. My three broad questions are to quantify the distribution and habitat preferences of feral cats, to understand whether there's any evidence of feral cats and dingoes interacting with one another, and then finally, if feral cats are a problem, recommend how we might be able to manage their populations in rainforests going forward. Uh, now, for the first two objectives, I used the same data methodology in the field to actually gather my data, but the analysis is different. So the first thing I'll do is describe the field sampling design and then go from there. So in order to gather data for my first two objectives, I carried out camera trapping in the road and in the bush throughout the wet tropics. This covered four national parks, a state forest, a wildlife sanctuary and a cattle property. Cameras were spaced at 2.2 kilometre intervals along the road, as this was the only estimate for a feral cat home range I could find from a rainforest globally. They were deployed for approximately six weeks at a time, and this gave me a total of 108 different camera trap sites. Now, these camera trap sites were deployed along roads and the main gradient within the wet tropics, which is elevation running from east to west, as elevation drives not only temperature, but also precipitation and therefore primary production and a whole suite of other factors within the wet tropics. Now, I want to explain a little bit more about how I set up each of my camera trap sites. And to do that, I'm going to use this schematic here. So for each camera trap site, we would first deploy a camera trap pointing perpendicular across an already established road or trail within the wet tropics. And this was because we thought that, as most predators would, feral cats are going to use the road to traverse the landscape more efficiently and improve their effectiveness at hunting. However, there are certain theories that think that feral cats should avoid the road to avoid encountering humans, dingoes, and other species that might cause them harm. So this is where the bush camera came in. 50 meters perpendicular to the road camera, we deployed a camera in the forest and pointed it in the nearest clear direction. This is in case feral cats are avoiding the road, but also provides the added benefit of it enables us to monitor the community of wildlife that you would expect to avoid roads, such as musky rat kangaroos that could provide a food source for feral cats. Now I've explained how I deployed my cameras in the field, I'm going to move on to answer the first question of my project, which was to quantify the distribution and habitat preferences of feral cats. To do this, I took advantage of single species occupancy modelling. Now, occupancy can be regarded as the probability of a site being used by a particular species. Um, it's a really good measure of site use because it accounts for imperfect detection. I.e. you were surveying the environment, the animal was present, but you failed to detect it on your survey period. 
This is particularly relevant for camera traps given their comparatively narrow field of view and the fact that they're pointed in one direction. Another significant benefit is that unlike spatial micro capture, it does not require individual species to be identifiable. I don't have to be able to say from the coat pattern that Derek was here at this time and on this date to be able to get a decent number. And it overcomes a series of assumptions tied to that. And it uses detection and non-detection data through time. So one, your species was detected, zero, it was not detected, or NA, which means that your camera wasn't functioning for a variety of possible reasons, such as SD card or battery failure. Now, Mood and colleagues provide a really nice illustration of the potential of occupancy models with the black dots representing camera trap sites placed across an elevation gradient. And using occupancy modeling, they were able to show that ocelots avoided areas of low elevation here in the light blue, and actually preferred areas of high elevation here in the bright pink with an occupancy value of one, meaning you're pretty much certain to find them at the top of this range. Now, in my study, we used something called a Royal Nichols variant of the single species occupancy model. And what this basically means is that the Royal Nichols model assumes that there is heterogeneity in the abundance of species between your sites is going to drive the detection probability and it's going to differ between sites. And the theory around this is that sites with more animals are likely to have an increased probability of detecting your species. And I've just illustrated this with this drawing here. So on site one, you've got three cats and the two cameras, and it seems less likely that you're going to detect as many cats within your survey period as you are in site two, where there's lots of cats moving all through the forest. And I feel this is a reasonable assumption for my study, as there's a range of different national parks, habitat types, and management uses that could account for a difference in abundance and therefore detection probability. So this is the first result from the study. And on the y-axis, I have the relative feral cat abundance per site, which is lambda in the raw Nichols model. And what I'm trying to show here with sites only from the wet tropics is that sites in the green from national parks generally have higher relative abundance than non-national parks shown here in orange. And actually for sites like Kirima, this difference is significantly higher than the two non-national park sites. And this really has important conservation implications. The fact that feral cats seem to be having higher relative abundance in a national park where species such as the Atherton antichinus lives could have some really big implications in terms of conservation management. I then wanted to see how feral cat relative abundance in the wet tropics compared to other sites within Australia that were predicted to have more feral cats as the wet tropics were predicted to have little to no feral cat populations. So the wet tropics is shown here in purple. And then there's a site from South Australia called Dingo, which was done by Bronwyn Fancourt. And then this is Florio Peninsula near Kangaroo Island studied by Pat Taggart. And these are the only sites to produce raw Nichols occupancy models that I could find, so I can then take these values forward. And what we can clearly see here is that despite the predictions of feral cats being absent or in low abundance in the Australian wet tropics, their relative abundance is actually comparable to uh, three other sites within Australia potentially suggesting that eco-region specific studies of feral cat abundance could be called for to try and generate conservation uh, outcomes and implications. Now, moving on to the drivers of feral cat occupancy within the Australian wet tropics, the, I'm now using an occupancy scale, so zero, the, there's unlikely to be feral cats residing in that habitat patch all the way up to one, they're almost certainly there. And the top model was an interaction between terrain ruggedness and elevation. So as the terrain ruggedness increases, the topography around the camera trap site becomes more complex and difficult to maneuver through. Feral cat occupancy actually increases, so you're more likely to find a cat in a rugged environment. And then as elevation declines, you move up the mountainside, you're less likely to find feral cats and they prefer low elevation, topographically complex study sites. Now this agrees with global models on feral cat distribution, but disagrees with some Australian models on the same topic. And I think there's one key reason for this, at higher elevation, it's wetter consistently, and that likely is a less favorable environment. Feral cats are less able to move in higher areas of high rainfall. They generally stay low and don't do very much, as shown by satellite coloring, and that limits their time to find food and hunt. I also think that in the rugged topography, the more rugged terrain in the wet tropics actually has a reduced understory complexity, which likely favors the feral cat ambush hunting technique as these inter intermediate areas of understory complexity still provide the cat cover to stealthily hunt prey, but also it's not so complex that it inhibits their ability to maneuver through the habitat. And those findings have been submitted to the Journal of Animal Ecology. So having established that feral cats are pretty much everywhere in the wet tropics and were found at all of our study sites and the elevation and ruggedness were their main drivers, I now want to understand if there's any evidence that dingoes and feral cats can interact with one another. 
And for a bit of context to this question, I really want to establish that being the middle predator is really hard work in these systems. Not only do you need to be able to hunt to capture your own food to then successfully feed, increase your own fitness and then reproduce, you also need to make sure you're not eaten by the top dog in the system, in this case, the dingo. And therefore, as a meso predator, you need to balance your ability to acquire food and not become food for somebody else. Now, within Australia, the role of dingo cat, dingoes on feral cat control is really controversial. As you can see, this is only a few of the articles that I could have pulled out to discuss this topic. And the theory broadly states that, um, well, the debate centers around the idea that dingoes could potentially create either a refuge in space for native fauna by actively repelling feral cats from an area or reducing their numbers or controlling their population in some way. They could create a refuge in time for native fauna by excluding feral cats from being active at certain times of the day and therefore represent a natural control method for feral cat populations and overall benefiting native mammals. So I'm just going to take a step back from that and ask, well, how do you avoid becoming dinner for somebody else? And most anti-predator strategies are tied to either space or time. So spatially, you can avoid sites occupied by predators. And Farris and colleagues were able to show that the Phalanook, a native uh, mammal in Madagascar, avoided sites occupied by the feral doll, um, and therefore simply just reduced their likelihood of encountering them by not occurring in the same habitat as them. However, if you're unable to avoid your predator spatially, you can also alter your activity pattern to reduce your likelihood of having an encounter with that predator. Now, the most extreme example of this is that you can switch your activity pattern from being diurnal to nocturnal or vice versa. However, this is very rare, but it was seen in the invasive American mink in the UK, which throughout the 90s was largely nocturnal, and then following increases of populations of otters and polecats, switched to a diurnal activity to reduce competition. But it should be noted that the most common response to altering your activity pattern is to shift your peak of activity, either within the nocturnal or diurnal activity. And I really want to highlight that this represents a big trade-off for mesopredators, because not only do you have to be active at the same time as your prey to even be able to hunt it and catch it, you have to avoid that dingo or that predator as well in the system. So the first thing I wanted to do was establish whether in the Australian wet tropics there is any evidence that dingoes repel feral cats spatially, i.e. do cats avoid sites occupied by dingoes. And to do this, I employed a two species occupancy model. And this is regarded as a measure of coexistence between the two species. Do they occur independently? Are they attracted or do they avoid one another? And what it does is it generates an occupancy estimate and measures if the dominant species, in this case the dingo, alters the occupancy or detection probability of the subordinate species, in this case, the feral cat. And in total, I had 1,112 dingo events to work with and 524 feral cat events to work with. And what I found was there was no significant interaction between the dingo or the feral cat spatially, and that the feral cat's occupancy was best described by habitat covariates and not by the occupancy of the dominant species, the dingo. And this suggests that the site use of feral cats is independent of dingoes in the Australian white tropics. So given that cats aren't spatially avoiding dingoes, I wanted to try and work out if they were altering their activity pattern in any way to reduce their likelihood of encountering a dingo. So I needed to see if they were either becoming diurnal, which they can do in certain conditions, or nocturnal or shifting their activity peaks. To do this, I generated kernel density activity curves. Now, the area under each of these curves can be regarded as the number of independent detections at a given time of day, with midnight being in the middle of the graph, the blue area representing nocturnal activity, and the yellow area representing diurnal activity. Now, all of this data is from rainforest habitat only, not eucalypt forest. And as you can see, the feral cats are the black line, increasing in activity at dusk, declining throughout the night, and then having a small increase again around pre-dawn and then generally declining and not being active at all during the day. In comparison, the dingo is much less active at the beginning of the night, peaking in activity before dawn, and is also generally more diurnal than the feral cat. However, they have significant, a significant proportion of overlap between the two species, the 68%, this area under the curve, suggesting they're both predominantly nocturnal. And importantly, the activity peaks, as measured by Watson-Wheeler test, were significantly different from one another. Now, what this suggests is that feral cats are avoiding dingoes in time by being more active at dusk and less active around dawn. I wanted to investigate this relationship a little bit further and see if feral cat activity differed at sites where dingoes were not detected compared to sites where dingoes were detected. Again, this data is from rainforest habitat only, and this is now only measures of feral cat activity patterns. 
with the black solid line representing camera trap sites where dingoes were detected and the orange dotted line representing camera trap sites where the dingo is not detected throughout the survey period. And what we can see is the even in the presence or absence of dingo, feral cats maintain a nocturnal activity pattern. However, the activity pattern is significantly different when dingoes are detected compared to when they're not detected. When dingoes are not detected, feral cats seem to be much more uniformly active throughout the night and also um, stop being active later in the day and become active earlier in the day as well. Whereas when dingoes are detected, they display a much more peaky activity pattern, likely representing a temporal avoidance of dingo habitat use. So I feel like I've shown now that feral cats don't avoid sites occupied by dingoes. They don't shift their activity pattern to die on law nocturnal to avoid the dingo. They stay nocturnal. And actually, it's most likely a shift in activity peak to compensate for the fact that dingoes are present in the environment. And ultimately, what this all means is that in the context of the Australian wet tropics, dingoes are really unlikely to manage feral cat populations. And this sort of agrees with literature from the past in that historically, even at their peak abundance without any farmer management, dingoes actually couldn't stop feral cats spreading to 99% of Australia. So if they couldn't stop them spreading historically, why would they be able to stop them spreading now? And the, another key feature from this study was that feral cats and dingoes both used roads preferentially over the bush habitat, with about 14 feral cat detections occurring in the bush out of 524, and roughly 30 dingo detections at 1,112 occurring in the bush compared to on the road. And this could artificially increase the encounter rate between feral cats and dingoes, leading to a negative outcome for the feral cat. However, we have very clear evidence of how a feral cat responds to encountering a dog. When human Gregor and colleagues uh, went to trap feral cats, they used a detection dog to find them. And when confronted by the dog, the feral cat would frequently escape up a tree and have to be darted to be then removed from the tree. Therefore, in the Australian wet tropics, you can even see in this background, there's going to be lots of trees for cats to escape up. So even if they come across a dingo whilst being active at the same time of day in the same space, it's more than likely a feral cat, which is more agile, is going to escape up a tree before a negative outcome can occur with a dingo. Now, at this point, the talks will be in very doom and gloom. I've told you that feral cats are more common in national parks. They're, throughout, they're found throughout the wet tropics and the dingoes are unlikely to represent a natural management option for them. So now I want to go forward and try and maybe establish a way that we could manage feral cat populations in a complex environment. And to do this, I carried out a series of trapping uh, in two different national parks and I used 10 rubber leg draw traps and 60 cage traps to try and catch myself a feral cat. I used a range of lures that have been shown to be successful in other parts of Australia. This includes auditory laws, such as a speaker playing the noise of a distressed rodent or a feral cat calling. Visual laws, such as the CD and feather combination, you can see hanging at the back here over a leg jaw trap in the middle there. Food, such as sardines and KFC, which again, people swear by in other parts of Australia. Olfactory laws, which are slightly more unpleasant, such as the cat anal gland extract or domestic cat feces. And finally, some of the more wacky lures that the rangers in Wurundjeri National Park said that they had success with these Furbies, which imitate, I would like to think, a distressed small rodent moving around at the back of the cage to try and draw that cat in with um, a different kind of lure. As I've said, the locations for these uh, trapping studies were in two different national parks, Wurunurin and Kirima. Uh, now, Wurunurin is the park at the top here, and the orange lines are a road network, and the red line is the national park outline. So within Wurundjeri, given that it's got a much uh, denser road network, I used clusters of trap, five traps placed every 1.5 kilometers to really maximize my spatial coverage within the park. And then Kirima is slightly different in that it's got one road running through it pretty much. So I put a trap every 100 meters given the high density of cats in this area. And I spent about a month at both of those sites each. Now, after approximately 1500 nights of trap effort, I didn't catch anything in the leg draw traps. And all I was able to catch in the cage traps was several different small mammal species, such as the giant white-tailed rat you can see here. It looks like they've had a really good time trashing the Furby, knocking over the anal gland, and then eating some fish as well for good measure. Now, the main reason I think I was unable to catch a feral cat is that cats are known to be wary of new things in their environment and neophobic. And in the more arid areas of Australia, they're going to be really food stressed and lack uh, sort of resources. So by placing something, a novel food item down in your cage, because they're so nutrient stressed, they're more likely to overcome their neophobia to get that food reward. However, if you look in the picture at the top here, you can see a feral cat carrying a giant white tailed rat, which weighs about half a kilogram, 
past one of my leg draw sets. So I just don't think I could offer them anything more attractive than the already the food they already know in their environment that's fresh and readily available for them to catch. So I've demonstrated that traditional methods are likely to be ineffective in rainforests. So what next? That's where the Felixer comes in. The Felixer has been de developed by Thylation Limited, and it's an automated cat management tool that exploits the feral cat's preference for moving along linear habitat features in landscapes. And it delivers a lethal dose of 1080 in a gel format to encourage the cat to groom it and therefore consume the 1080. And when you compare that to native wildlife who are resistant to 1080, and also less fastidious about grooming than feral cats, it makes it a really specific and nice tool to trial in the rainforest environment. So how does the Felixer work? Well, it's quite a complicated piece of kit, but it's really effective, and it uses LiDAR sensors as uh, beam triggers. And to be activated, both activation sensors need to be blocked at the same time, whilst both of the blocking sensors need to be unobstructed. And this takes uh, advantage of the biology of native species, such as this beton, in that compared to invasive species such as feral cats, native Australian fauna is generally shorter and squatter and is more likely to trigger one of the blocking sensors. Then finally, if both of the activation sensors are cut, both of the blocking sensors are free, an algorithm then makes a decision on whether the Felixer should fire or not. And this is primarily based on the speed of the animal to prevent it from hitting a grazing, slow moving macropod. Now, the Felixer has displayed some really promising results. In total, it's recorded 334 different wildlife events. And importantly, for the conservation of off targets, such as the spotted tailed quoll, the southern cassowary, and the red legged padamelon, it has successfully recognized them, even though the quoll and the padamelon are arguably a similar shape to the feral cat and did not fire at them. Now, in total, it detected 75 feral cats, and it only fired on 21 of them. And here you can see an image in the top left highlighting that. The feral cat is probably too close to the Felixer and moving too slowly. And as we had it in conservative mode to make sure it wasn't firing all the time, it has concluded that this might not be a feral cat incorrectly. However, the Felixer has had some really promising results as well. It's been active since the 13th of the 5th until now. And in that time, it's fired upon 21 individual feral cats. However, one identifiable feral cat has been fired upon and seen since, but it's pretty likely that this cat is old and not grooming properly. But in these images, you can see that the activation sensors have been triggered and that blocking sensor has gone straight underneath the cat as designed and therefore it has been fired upon. Now, what I really want to hit home with on the, the trapping effort is that despite 1500 nights, I wasn't able to catch anything. And that was a lot of effort, man hours. And if it was Parks and Wildlife Service carrying out this work, it would have been a significant financial investment of money that could have been spent elsewhere. However, in comparison, over only 130 nights, a single Felixer unit has effectively caught 20 feral cats, which works out as one cat roughly every 6.5 days. Now, if this was to be scaled up to a national park level with multiple um, Felixes across a national park, you could really easily see how it could make quite a significant dent in the feral cat population residing in that national park. So in conclusion, I think I've demonstrated that feral cats are everywhere in the wet tropics and that elevation and ruggedness are their main drivers in this system. That unfortunately, dingoes don't represent a viable management option for feral cats and that they're simply altering the peak of activity to reduce their likelihood of encountering a dingo. And that although traditional methods are currently ineffective, the Felixer looks like a promising alternative with analysis to follow on its efficacy. And finally, I'd like to once again acknowledge the traditional owners of the field sites that for allowing me access i'd like to thank all of my field volunteers for their long suffering hours following me around the rainforest and getting generally muddy and a bit miserable i'd like to thank the funding agencies for funding my field work and finally the nesp for the symbols used in the graphics throughout this talk thank you for listening and any questions